اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سبحان کا لا علمنا الا ما علمتنا انکا انت العلیم الحکیم ففہمنا سلیمان و کلنا تینا حکم و علم رب شرح لی صدری ویسل لی امری وحلل اقدتا باللسان یفقہ قولی لا حول ولا قوت الا باللہ العلی العظیم سبحان کلمو وحنا نیک علمنا تنسنی ملا تنسنی الحمدللہ عبدال الحمد اللہم صلی اللہ محمد و علی آلہ و سائر نبیین و صالحین و سلم علم وفقنی و حدنی و سددنی و جملی بین السواب و ثواب و عذنی من الخط و الحرمان آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ and welcome to another episode of questions and answers I'm your host I'm Jid Muhammad so we get the show on the road as they say Um, you got a, you know, we got two sets, uh, two uh, parts before we split in the middle. And uh, as usual, I ask you to call out or call in on 01274, that's Bradford 01274 214299. So 01274 214299. If you call in with your questions, then we will be able to deal with them. And as usual, when we do get these questions, it does take a while to A for the question and to pose their question, have a little conversation and then give a response. So we tend not to have much time more than to be able to deal with three or four questions. So if you have a burning issue, then please do call in so that it gets dealt with straight away, inshallah. As also a, a protocol or method is what I do is uh, those questions that I receive on our platform, on our channels that we have, that we get questions coming in. I'll also be dealing with some of them questions as well. So it gives an opportunity for you to the type of questions that we have coming in and also the type of responses that we give. So make use of this uh, service, make use of this opportunity, inshallah, um, so that at least you can gain knowledge, but at the same time, uh, hopefully in a relatively fun way, in a less uh, challenging way, or in a less sort of scary way. Sometimes people say to me that ulama are difficult to approach because they're quite scary or they're very sort of strict and therefore, you know, we feel a bit uncomfortable uh, to pose our questions to, to the ulama. I hope that I've demonstrated in the weeks and months that I've been sharing time with you that hopefully that, you know, I'm a reasonably friendly chap. So please do reach out, give us a call, inshallah and we will deal with your queries. So, whilst we wait for those calls to come in, let me take up some uh, questions that have come already on uh, our various platforms. Okay, so let's go to this question here. Okay, um, here's an interesting question here. Um, is bird poop? <laughs> is bird poop? I think it means poo. Napak. I don't know what type of bird it was. Um, so, generally speaking, well, let me uh, click on this one and reply to that. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Generally speaking, the type of birds that will be flying overhead in the UK are going to be pigeons, swans, maybe ducks, um, maybe seagulls, these type of birds. So, if they were to, uh, uh, as the word goes, poop on us, then that wouldn't be considered as an impurity as such. However, obviously, if you had the chance to remove it, then one would remove it. But if one prayed with that on, then there would be no harm associated with there. Okay. So that, I hope, has, uh, has dealt with that issue. Um, and then, as usual, I add my um, code so people will know how to find it. thing to bear in mind is that, you know, one is the hukum, yani the ruling on a particular matter. And one is something in which is you know, appropriate to do. So taking this question, and you know, some people have said, you know, I have blood on my clothes, can I pray with them? Um, you know, I have urine on my clothes, can I pray with them? I have you know, maybe some feces or something on my clothes, can I pray on them? Now really what the, when we, these sorts of questions are, should be asked is when someone finds out after they've prayed. So they didn't check their clothes properly, they thought their clothes were you know, pure, tahir, clean, so they prayed. After they finish their prayer, uh, they notice, oh my God, there's a blood stain on my trousers or a blood stain on my, on my garment, on my shirt. Now they're worried about the salah that they've already prayed. So that's the type of questions we you know, normally should expect for when it comes to um, the harder questions. When it comes to that you know that there's blood on you or you know that there's urine on you or there's a good possibility because you didn't 
uh, you know, deal with the urine effectively or properly. You didn't wait long enough to do istibra. You didn't wait long enough to do istinja. And as a point, you feel uh, a slight dampness in your undergarments. So you're pretty certain since you haven't poured any water there that it must be urine. Now, a person shouldn't pray, you see. What they should do is uh, they should change their garments uh, because there's a, you know, if there's been no other water or no other liquid, then it must only be urine, especially after the person's been to the toilet. So then the person should cleanse themselves. Not think, ah, actually, because the, 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 circum the area of the urine is less than a 50 pence piece, it's only a couple of drops, so that should be okay. No, you know, purify the clothes, change the clothes, and then pray. Remember, these questions with najasa on clothes, najasa in the area that you're praying, these are mainly to do with after the incident, after you've already prayed and then you notice impurity. And now you're concerned about the validity of your prayer because obviously there are conditions associated with the validity of prayer. And with the validity of prayer, um, the, one of the conditions is to be both in clothing and in terms of body, physically, and in terms of the area of prayer to be clean from impurities. And obviously blood, urine, and uh, another creature's uh, feces are considered as impure. So I hope that that deals with this in a more general way. Uh, there's another question here, and I'm going to change the names uh, of the individuals that are said here, because it does mention people by name. So I'm just going to put some names in here, okay? My brother Fana has asked for my second talaq. Okay, I think what they mean by that is he has asked for second talaq, not for my second talaq, because clearly not somebody does not marry their brother. On Friday the 7th of May 2021, on behalf of me. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So uh, the lady's brother has requested talaq on her behalf, for some reason, uh, from her husband. So let's call her husband Abdullah. So Abdullah then gave the second talaq on the 8th of May. So let's get this. One of the important things is, is to provide as much details as possible when you ask a question. So the scenario is this, and the Mufti's job is to build the scenario in his mind so that he ensures that he's got all the characters in, in the situation and what has been said, what has been done, are there anything which is time sensitive, at what date it was said, at what time it was done. So everything is clear in the mind of the Mufti. Once, because the actual is the, the, the key part of answering the question is that the Sawal of Sawal is to picture the question, is to really analyze the question. Because once you've analyzed the question, the answer tends to be then relatively simple. Obviously, depending if you have ilm, then the answer is relatively simple. The errors that people make often is they haven't taken a full grasp of the question. And that is usually because the person asking the question has not supplied enough information or, uh, and as a result, because they've not supplied enough information, the mufti has made assumptions. So he's filled in the gaps to make the assumptions and therefore he has then sort of come up to a conclusion which can be incorrect. But anyway, before we get back to this question, we have a call awaiting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I haven't seen any swans flying around in my area. <laughs> How are you, sir? Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Salameen. Good to hear your voice again, mashallah. Keeping well? And, and you, sir, fine, fine, fine. Um, before I say anything, I had a little, well, a little text with uh, Imam Imran, and he said he's going to London on Friday or Sunday, and he might pop around. I said, you're most welcome. Very good. Was he was he on here on Ikra, or was he on his uh, on the other one? On his, uh, well, I got his number. I just oh, mashallah. Oh, wow, fantastic. Alhamdulillah. Well, if I was down that way, I'm sure I would have also joined joined in there. Uh, but us, us northerners uh, uh, rarely, you know, make it past uh, the M606. So uh, maybe another time, inshallah. Well, he's in Wakefield. He's not far from here. I think. No, he's... Uh, wait, where's he based at the moment now? Where's he based now? He's in uh, Tallery. Ah, he's Manchester. Bolton. Yeah, Bolton. Man yeah, Bolton, Manchester. Way. Yeah, but he must be tri driving down there anyway. That's why. No, he's going to London in touch. So yeah, no. yeah, yeah. He's probably got some work there. The, the, there's a studio there as well, isn't there, for a TV? So um, may, maybe he's in that studio. Probably. Um, so what should we discuss today? Oh, whatever you want, Masha. That's your cho your choice. You uh, have the choice. Yeah, let's let's discuss why we are here on Earth. Sure. To, to try and attain Jannah. Let's talk about death. What happens in death? I was just checking out 
uh, like I said, I was watching homicide programs, and uh, they, uh, but they exhumed the body after five years to check a bite mark out on a lady. So wow. I was thinking, five years, uh, is the skin still on the body? You, uh, uh, that was seemed amazing to me. And then I checked it out on Shake Google, and it says a body in a metal casket can last up to 10 years, airtight casket. Yes, because really the decomposition is due to the environment yeah. and not necessarily yeah. the, uh, yeah. the what's in there. So, yeah, so yeah. you even find in these kind of mausoleums, particularly Italian families in, in, the Italian, in, in, in Italy, when they seal them in the mausoleum, they can be in there for, for, for a long yeah. time and they, there's very little uh, decomposition which takes place. So, yes, that, I, that's acceptable. That's right. um, they were saying normal in outside, it just takes... 7 to 14 days to decompose. But if it's an air tide, no insects can get there, no air can get in there. But the main reason for asking is, so when when death comes to us, does our soul depart straight away and go straight to hell or heaven and... Yeah, that's a good, interesting question. So let me let me let me respond to that. Fantastic, Jazak Mahe for that. No, I'll let you. Uh, I'll listen to you. On the absolutely, TV. absolutely. Make sure you do. Make sure you do. Okay. So uh, the passage of the soul. Um, oh, sorry, we've got another caller calling, so let's take this call first. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sir, I want to speak to somebody. It's a rather personal thing. I want to have some real good advice from oh. a noble person. Okay, well, is it something you can say in public or would you prefer it to be said in private? Private, please. Okay, um, if you leave your details with the, the, the producer, inshallah, then we will get someone to contact you. Okay, I think, yep, so the sister's gone there, inshallah. Uh, so whilst uh, the producer's dealing with that query, um, let's uh, take the question that came from our brother again. So when a person is dying, what, what's the process? So I, I always like to rewind it up. So let's rewind it even earlier than that. Let's rewind it back to when the person's alive. And let's rewind it even earlier than that. He's in his mother's womb. Let's rewind it even earlier than that. He's when amongst the souls. Now, remember, the souls were created. Once the souls were created, they stayed in the abode of the souls. We were all in the abode of the souls. We all gave shahada to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to declare that he is our one true God. And he is the one and there's none worthy of worship. And then from that, we were, our bodies were created. And when our bodies were created, we were sent upon earth at different times, obviously. And the relationships of father, son, uh, son, grandson, great grandson, all the way down and across brothers, sisters, that was established by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then we were born into the world. How were we born into the world? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed which year, which century, where physically we would be born, who our parents would be. He planned all of that. So when he planned all of that, when our time came, whatever it was, when the year I was born, for example, the fact that before I was born, my parents had to be born. Then my parents had to marry. Then when my parents married, I was born. So you can see how much planning went on. Because, you know, my mother was born in a house. My father was born in a house. He, they came from particular parents. So it all had to link in for that particular moment for me to be born. Going back all the way, you know, thousands of years ago. So when I was born, okay, prior to that, or was anybody born prior to that, there are obviously a biological entity inside their mother's womb. So like the mother has a heart, like she has a kidney, like she has an arm, like she has a foot, then she also starts to grow within her this extra piece of flesh. And this extra piece of flesh is going to eventually become a human. So then that soul, remember the soul that was created, is, amongst, is in the abode of the souls. That soul then makes its way into, uh, is blown into this piece of flesh, which eventually becomes a human, that is inside the mother's womb. The mother then gives birth to this person. This person, the soul is now attached to this person and this person grows. So he goes through being a baby, to being a toddler, to being, you know, a, a five, six, seven year old, and then to being a teenager, and then after a teenager to becoming a, you know, young person, and then middle-aged, and then old age, and then eventually die. Now that's not the plan for everybody, but majority, 80% of the people, that's the plan what they go through. 
significant number, 20% or maybe more, die, you know, either at birth, die either in their, you know, before they even hit 10, die in their teens, die in their 20s, die in their 30s, die in their 40s. So there are people dying all the time. There's no fixed time that where you're going to die. But that, as in there's no agreed time or there's no time that we, everybody thinks that they're going to die at 60. There is obviously a fixed time, like we had a fixed birth. We also have a fixed death. And that fixed death was already predestined for us even before we were born. Even when we were souls with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now the soul was breathed in by the angel when we were within the mother's womb. Now the soul has to be detached from the body. Because remember the body, the, the fetus what did not have the soul attached to it. The soul had to be blown in from the heavens. It was brought down and blown in. Now obviously that soul has, gone quite, has come, become quite attached to this body, this organic body. So now dis disconnecting it is going to be harder. So if you look at the method in which the soul is attached, it's by blowing in. And blowing is quite delicate. But when the soul is removed, it is literally pulled. Okay, because it's stuck. It's like, like Velcro. Okay, so when you've got Velcro, you've got to really kind of yank at it. Especially if that Velcro has been closed for a long, long time. It's not just as straightforward as, uh, as just sort of grabbing the end and pulling it off. A bit like a plaster, I guess. So it's going to, and uh, yeah, plaster is a good example, actually. So as you're pulling on the plaster, it's hurting every time. Until eventually it comes, it comes and that's it, it com comes off the wound. So, the, so when we're dying, then uh, the angels are sent down to collect our soul. Now, depending on what type of death we're going to have, that's the appearance the souls will be, or the angels will be. So either they will come in a very good form, pleasant smelling, pleasant attitude, looking beautiful, and we will see them as we get close to the, our death, because then the, uh, the unseen becomes visible to us, uh, and we start to see these sorts of things. And they will gently, as best as they can, draw out the soul from the body. And when they do, and that's why it mentions that the soul is dragged from the feet up the legs and eventually it leaves from the nostrils or it leaves from the top part. And that's why the eyes follow the soul as it's taken out. So when the angels take this soul out, if let's assume it's a good soul, Alhamdulillah that Allah gives us this death, I mean, then they gingerly wrap up the soul like a baby, like the way baby is delivered. They literally deliver the soul. They then wrap it up, anoint it, make it smell quite nice. And then they carefully take it up. Like a baby is born, uh, the women in the house, especially not necessarily the men, all want to grab the baby, don't they? So the sister wants to grab the baby, the mother wants to grab the baby, and everybody wants to grab the baby. They want to hold the baby. And they're jostling for the baby, and everybody's peering, trying to look at it. In the same way, when this soul is a beautiful soul, the angels will all want to grab the baby, the soul in this case. They're peering over, wanting to look at it. And they will gingerly pass it to one another, until it makes its way all the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will speak well to it, with the soul, be, that he is pleased with the soul. So in this meantime now, whilst the soul is going on this journey, this person has died. So what happens now, this person, obviously we tie off the person's chin, we tie the feet together, and we now prepare this person for ghusl. We take the deceased for ghusl, remove their clothes, remove any najasa, and follow the ritual process and procedure to give ghusl to the deceased. Once we then place the soul in the uh, kafan, apply the uh, cloths to the person, the soul then returns. When the soul now returns, now this person, so it attaches again to the body, but it does not attach in the same way it was attached when it was alive. That's a strong attachment which gave the body life. The soul gave that body life. Okay. Now this is a weak attachment. So what happens now is this person has janazah prayed over them. Once they have janazah prayed over them, they're then taken to rest in the grave. So once they're placed into the grave, 20 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes after, the angels come to ask him questions or her questions. And we know the questions that they will ask. And remember, these answers that people will give won't necessarily be academic answers. They will be what you believe. Now you see our tongue can say something which is contrary to what's in our heart. When we rest in our grave, our tongue cannot say something contrary to our heart. It will speak what's in the heart. And we obviously we're not going to be very happy with the tongue because it's speaking against us, but the tongue will speak. Whereas now you see, we manipulate the tongue. We can get the tongue to say anything. As long as people are gullible enough to accept it, we will lie, we will deceive, we will do whatever we think we're going to do. 
So the questions will come, man rabbuk, man deen, you know, what's your, who is your rabb, what is your deen, uh, ma kala, you know, what do you say regarding this uh, uh, mayakul, what do you say regarding this man, yani Rasulullah sallallahu And we will respond to those questions as we believe, okay, not making an answer up. And the situation will be so grave, literally, that we won't be able to have the confidence to give the answers, even though we'll be very confident now. Some people will say, come on, how can we not be confident? Well, I say that why don't you stand in front of a large group of people and recite Surah Al-Fatiha? You know, saying here and speaking to the audience back home, it may look easy, but trust me, it ain't easy, okay? So standing in front of people and talking is a very difficult act to do. So imagine standing up and praying Surah Al-Fatiha to people in front of them. People get very, very nervous and they will make mistakes even in Surah Al-Fatiha. That's how that person will be in his grave. He won't be as confident as he thinks he will be and he will make errors. As for what happens next, well, you're going to have to join me shortly because we've got plenty to say as to the process after those questions, the first three questions, for the journey of the soul. So join me again shortly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.